Yeah, see, it, it, it takes a while, and I think it's because everybody is online using streaming platforms or, or what have you, you know? Wow, yeah. So, okay, yeah, so, so it actually takes a few seconds. All right, so hello, everyone. This is Dwight Woods and Richard Rycraw. Uh, we're about five minutes early, but we're having such a pleasant conversation before, and I didn't want to... I didn't, I, I didn't want to monopolize him and, and, <laughs> and take advantage of his, his good nature. So this is episode number 124 of the Jikendo Dialogues. Now, um, Richard, you and I have never met in person. I don't, I don't think, even though because I saw you I've, and I've seen you so long ago, I feel like we did. Do you have any, any recollection if we did? Um, I don't believe we have, no. I know we have a lot of mutual friends, though. Oh, well, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. So everyone, so my, my, my dialogue partner today then is a guy that I probably was first introduced um, on Burt Richardson's first uh, video series for Unique Publications. So I'm sure he's got a ton of stories to tell us and he's got a lot of stuff that we will learn uh, from him about those days. So Richard Reichrau, welcome to the G Kondo Dialogues. Thank you, thank you. It's an honor, and I, I thank you for including me in this because I've been watching it in my self-imposed isolation, and uh, I've seen a lot of great martial artists and great <laughs> people. So it's just an honor to be counted among them. So thank you. Well, I, and I I really appreciate the sartorial splendor, but now I feel like I'm I'm you know I, I'm I'm not worthy. I mean, the, how how pretty you are compared to this thing, oh. you know? Wait, like I was telling you before, when I found out I was going to be in the JKD Chronicles, I had to represent, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so let me, let me see if I can do this. Are you featured in, in both of Bert's series? So this is series one. Are you featured in, in those? Do you remember? Yes, um, the first series, um, G Kundo, I think there was three tapes, and I'm featured in all three of them. And then in the outro, okay. um, we're um, kind of doing um, some uh, uh, stuff in the background in a silhouette. And then the second series, Defining G Kundo, there were six tapes, and I'm featured in those as well. Okay, all right. So you were you were in you were you were in everything. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Now, so what? What year? What year was this? Do you remember? Do you remember? Um, it was probably. I think it was the early nineties. Um, between I believe it was between like nineteen ninety and nineteen ninety three in that in that time frame. All right, I'm trying to get my hands on the. Um picture for the second series although I'm I'm pretty sure anybody who is paying attention will know but, but sometimes I take that for granted do you tell me if, if you if you if, if if I should I think if anybody today is paying attention to JKD even if they don't date back to the 1990s like you just mentioned I just assume that they know that Burt Richardson has nine tapes from 30 years ago. Is it safe to assume that? Uh, to a degree. I think that uh, for most of us martial artists, I think that that's an accurate statement. Um, I think though you have some millennials and some people that came after that when MMA was just becoming more popular and um, other arts like Krav Maga and things like that and JKD mm -hmm. kind of took a, a background to that that may not be as familiar with it. But um, I think for the most part, if anyone that's interested in JKD or has been following the unique publications, that um, Bert's um, information is all over there. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> to speak of, the, speak of the devil, he just put a comment in. He goes, 30 years ago, how old am I? <laughs> 32 <laughs> exactly right yeah you were a prodigy mr mr richardson and you start you, know, you started right out of the womb um so what what is your um what's your experience in dealing with millennials you have any of your own 
Um, not in particular. I have um, four kids, and I think uh, they would probably all, well, actually, yeah, I think all four of them would qualify as millennials, but um, uh, I, 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 my, my past work experience, I've worked for the last seven years at two college campuses, so I interact with them all the time. <laughs> And um, well, don't say anything that will get you in trouble, but what's your opinion of them? Um, well, a, a lot of people down millennials and they talk bad about them, but it's all relative because, you know, I was born in the mid 60s. And so in my, I guess I'm at the tail end of the baby boom generation. And so they had things that mm -hmm. they said about my generation, but then uh, it's all relative. Um, the millennials, they're a lot more tech savvy than we are. Um, yes. In yes. a lot of ways, they're more efficient with, with things, technology and things like that. Um, I think mm -hmm. where they're probably missing it a little bit is in the um, interpersonal relationships. And in terms of time, their attention span, they want everything now. You know, whereas when, when you and I were growing up, you know, if you if you wanted something to get to someone, you mailed a letter and you had to wait till the post office delivered it. Now you can just go on your phone and text somebody mm -hmm. and you got the information in a second. And mm -hmm. if they don't respond in five seconds, you think something's wrong. So those are the mm -hmm. two major things I see differently is the uh, difference in the attention span and just the difference in um, um, the interpersonal relationship. So now, how then does a martial art instructor in general, but even more specifically, a martial art, a, a Jeet Kune Do instructor, what then is a key towards getting through to them, do you think? Hmm. Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, I know Bert can probably answer that much better than I can, but in my opinion, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I but he doesn't have the look, right? <laughs> well, he, he, he probably has no, some As a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah, I got I, I, as a matter of fact, one of my students. Oh, no, sorry, no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say that uh, I got some pictures of Bert when he had the, the ponytail, but I'm not going to break those out. But. Uh, <laughs> oh, you don't have to. I'll, I'll take care of that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but no, I think in terms of the millennials, um, I think because their attention span is so short, um, I think um, using the technology that they're familiar with is helpful. Like I know Bert has the um, mm -hmm. Cinewali series that he's doing now with the with self-imposed, you know, because we're all on self-imposed isolation. I think that's a big key. Right. And then I think also um, in a one-to-one -one setting, I think that personal attention is important because um, I think they, they look, even though they're born with technology and, the, and they're used to interfacing with technology and maybe they're more comfortable with technology and with people, I think in that one-on-one -on -one interaction, it's a good opportunity to uh, increase their um, acumen and, and comfort, comfortability of dealing with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so, um, uh, I, that, that's one of the things that really impressed me with Bert because I met him in 1988 um, uh, at, at the USC Collie Sealot Club because I graduated from USC in 87. And then mm -hmm. after that, um, I was working in LA and I was doing a lot of research on campus. And I came across a flyer one day um, for um, the USC Collie Sealot Club. And I said, oh, let me check this out. And on the, the last podcast with Bert and Chris Kent, he kind of mentioned, he kind of alluded to it, but I, I came in the class, they're in the basement of the PE building, and I came in the class, right. and uh, I was just sitting there watching, and Bert came over to me, he had a big old smile on his face, greeted me, and he, he, had, he even offered to let me come in and join the class. And I said, well, no, no, I'm just, I'm just watching, I'm just watching. But uh, I sat and watched the whole class, and I was really impressed with the students, and I was just real impressed with his teaching technique. And um, at the, you know, as he mentioned, he used to be a catcher for USC's baseball team. And at that right. time, he looked like a catcher. I mean, he was a solid guy. You know, he, he yeah. wasn't he wasn't the fit. Can, can you see the picture? Can, can you see the picture I put up? 
Yeah, yeah, that's me, Bert, and Chad. When right? Bert was at, he was at a stick fighting tournament up in, I think, Fresno. Yeah, yeah, okay. Chad, okay. yeah. Chad and I uh, car pulled up there to to watch him compete. So, yeah, Chad Sahelski, another great, great martial artist who's gone on to do great things. Uh, I think I heard a rumor that he was involved with the John Wick series. I think <laughs> something like that, but yeah, yeah something like that. that. Yeah. So if you see us, say, Chad, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, Chad was yeah. It, it, Chad was an excellent martial artist because when when I first started at the USC club, he and I just hit it off right away. And um, so after after I went and watched the first class, um, I think I came back the next week, joined the class, got my sticks, met Chad, and then a couple other guys, Levy and Paul Tagle, and we would go to the class. Mm -hmm. I think it was on Tuesday nights. And then on Saturdays, we would get together at USC and practice what we learned in class. And so because of that, um, Paul, Levy, and um, Chad and I, we progressed a lot quicker than normal. And uh, right. I remember Bert, um, I, think, I think I'd been in the club, I think I'd maybe six months or something. And I remember Bert was saying, yeah, I want you guys to come to the Inosanto Academy. And he brought us to the Inosanto Academy and that's like the mecca, that, at the time, that was like the mecca for JKD. So I was, you know, <laughs> I was all in awe. Yeah. And then it was at the end of one of um, Guru Dan's um, advanced classes. And then at the end of the class, um, Bert introduced us and he had us in front of the class. And he had us just do something simple like the um, a Sinawali drill or something. And Guru Dan was, mm -hmm. was um, he gave us a lot of good words of encouragement. So that was huge in my life. That was huge. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I actually have had that same experience where my group, we meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then of their own accord, years ago, Glenn started bringing everybody to the park on Saturdays to review what we did during the week. You know, so it's it's really it's yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, and this is, I mean, he's been with me now uh, since uh, about twenty seventeen or something. So it's interesting that we still have modern day kids who are still as dedicated as you know to the art the way the old timers were. So that gives me hope that, and and I think I think one of the keys to it is what you just said. If you can get some one-on-one -on -one time with them, maybe yeah. you can get through to them, huh? Yeah, I believe so, because um, no matter how the times change, I think it's important that people have a role model or some somebody to look up to, somebody to model themselves after. You know, um, you know, Bruce right. Lee is, you know, for the JKD people, the alt, you know, Bruce Lee is, is at the top of that list. But then there's people like Guru Dan that come mm -hmm. after that. And then there's people like yourself, Chris Kent, Burt Richardson, um, the late Larry Hartzell, Richard Bustillo, people like that, that are contemporary with us, yeah. where we can look at them and say, hey, right. there's somebody I want to be like. And not, and, and not only in terms of fighting ability, but just as a human being, because the, the thing that impressed me most about um, uh, Guru Dan, as well as um, Burt, was that not only were they excellent martial artists, but more important than that, they were just great, solid human beings. And that's something that's, to me, it's really important that I think is kind of overshadowed nowadays in the in the martial arts community in general. <coughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, I coughed in my hand. You're not supposed to do that in uh -oh. Corona days. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me ask you this, because that, that's, that's interesting what you just said. So if we have so many role models, in the JKD world, what's one of the reasons or the reason why JKD does not have prominence the way it did 30, 40 years ago? Huh. Uh, because remember, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're talking about unique publications, right? Now, yeah. people might not know, they put out Inside Kung Fu magazine. Right. Would you say it's fair to say that Inside Kung Fu magazine built its reputation on JKD and Kali? 
I think to a degree. Um, I, I majored in business at USC, so for when I look at unique publication, I look at them like a. I mean, they're a business, right? So um, back in the early days, it was all karate and judo, and then Bruce Lee came along, and then they started to focus more on kung fu and and the Filipino martial arts, the, the Southeast Asian martial arts, and um, even you know to a degree some of the African martial arts. Um, and then oh, because it sells magazines and then over time, the trend started to go towards, um, uh, Brazilian jujitsu and that became popular. And then that started to dominate the magazine. And then it was, um, mixed martial arts. And so I think as a business, uh, from that standpoint, um, those type of publications are looking to sell magazines. And so they're looking for the latest, um, thing that that's going to pique people's yeah. interest and get them to buy that magazine. Um, yeah, I see that picture of me and Kalindi there. And, um, it is yeah, Kalindi, he, right? Okay, yeah. I wanted to yeah. ask you that. I thought it was. Yeah, that's yeah. that's Kalindi. Yeah, he he recently passed away. I think a couple of weeks ago, and um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but he. He's another example of a, a, a great person, a great martial artist. He's the one that introduced me to the African martial arts, actually. I know, I, I went to a work, he came to, that's at Burt School in Long Beach that he used to have. And um, that was my exposure to the martial, to the African martial arts. And I didn't get a chance to train with him as much as I would have liked to, but um, he really opened my eyes to the uh, totality of the African martial arts. And then, um, that okay. other picture there um, is uh, one of my cop the the guy that's the second from the left, Jim Sarah. He's my um, Capoeira Angola um, instructor. Um, that's when I first started. We were at Exposition Park, and uh, another great teacher, uh, great um, living example of the not only the um, Capoeira but the, uh, the martial arts in general. So, yeah. and that's what, and I consider myself fortunate because in my martial arts journey, I've met a lot of, I've had, been fortunate to have had a lot of great instructors like Bert, like Jim, like Kalindi, um, and uh, it, it, I've just been real fortunate that way. Yeah, y you know, when, when, uh, when I heard about Kalindi's passing, I went online to, to look him up. And one of the first things I came across was that he was um, apparently he was deep into the the um, the psilocybin uh, movement. Oh, I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. A apparently, the use of uh, of mushrooms as therapy and and what have you. He was really heavy into that. I had I I was not aware. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I wasn't either. Like I said, I, I, um, I had limited contact with him, but I know um, after that workshop he did at Bert's school, I believe Bert was the one that introduced him to um, some of the contacts at Unique Publication, and he had uh, uh, some articles in their magazines, and he had two uh, videotapes. Yes, yeah. a video series, yeah, yeah. Um, so you said that you, you, came across Bert's class at USC and you went and you watched the class. So there's two things I have to ask you about, actually three. So was that your first venture into martial art or had you done anything before that? Um, that was my first, well, that was my first official venture into martial art. Uh, prior to that, growing up, I've always had an interest in the martial arts for whatever reason. I don't know what it was. Um, Oh, it, I was tall. I, pl I played basketball. Right. My dad played uh, high school and college basketball. So he, he wanted me to be a basketball player. And I was a good basketball player, but I always had an interest in the martial arts. I would always watch, you know, black belt theater on the weekends and run around, but I didn't have any formal training. And then when I got to, co when I, when I got to high school, I had a, uh, there was a guy on my basketball team named Eduardo Velasquez from Puerto Rico. And he'd studied uh, karate. I believe it was Kempo, I believe it was Kempo karate. And so we would goof around and he'd show me some stuff. And then when I um, graduated and went to SC, 
um, I had an elective my freshman year, and it was actually a, a self-defense class, and the instructor in that class was teaching Kempo Karate. So that was my real first formal introduction to martial arts, was that um, martial yeah. arts class at SC. Yeah. Uh, so by, so uh, it, it kind of piqued my interest a little bit more, and then uh, when I saw that flyer, I didn't really know anything about the Filipino martial arts at the time. Uh, like everybody else, I knew mm -hmm. about Bruce I knew about Jeet Kune Do, uh, didn't know what it was, Bruce Lee's art. And at the time, I thought it was something that you could learn, like, you know, A, B, C, D. Okay, I've got it now. I'm a JKD person. But um, through learning the Filipino martial arts and being exposed to Jeet Kune Do and reading some of Bruce Lee's writings, I've come to realize that really it's more about, it, like Bruce Lee said, it, it's a journey of self-discovery. It's it's. It's a it's a a, a a style it's a style without a style, and um, right. yeah. I think that's I think that's what a lot of people miss nowadays because when they think of JKD, they think of you know finger jab, low kick, or straight blast, or the different elements that Bruce borrowed from the different arts. When I, in my opinion, because again I've never met Bruce Lee, but in my opinion, from my understanding of the art. Um, JKD, it's a journey of self-discovery. And um, one of my workout buddies, Larry Lee, uh, for my birthday, he got me this book called Mastery, and it was written by a, a judo practitioner. And in the book, the um, the, the central uh, theory... George Leonard? George Leonard's Mastery? I think that's it, yes. I yeah. believe that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ex excellent book for anybody out there that's looking for a quick read. And... Um, the, the, basically, the central theme of that book is that mastery is not a destination, it's a journey. It's like a stair step. Right. It's a never-ending journey. Right. And I think that if martial artists and JKD practitioners look at mastery that way, um, then they'll be a lot better off. As opposed to, to thinking, okay, I've got these five things, I'm JKD. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I have if I have it at arms in arm's reach, but I don't. But in Esquire magazine, May of 1987, they the the cover story was an article on mastery by George Leonard. Oh, and in May of 1987. I had been living in Miami for 11 months. So I, I don't think I had the school yet, or I may have just opened up the school. But I knew that I was going to keep that magazine. Yeah. I have it to this day. Yeah. Right? So, I, yeah, that's why I recognize, I recognize immediately what you're talking I've actually done... Um, the other podcast, the Wednesday podcast, the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast. I'll send you the link, but I've actually done a podcast on mastery and, oh. and how, it re how it relates to, to, uh, to Jeet Kune Do. But th the other thing I wanted to ask you about, though, you said that, that Burke came over to you and asked you about joining that first time that you went over. Was he just looking to enroll people, or do you think – that he saw something or sensed something. Uh, you know, I don't. I, I don't get the impression that he was trying to you enroll. Ever people. Him? Yeah, I don't. I don't get the impression that he was trying to enroll people because he didn't come at me like a telemarketer. Um, and, the, right. and, he had, <laughs> and he had quite a few people in the class at the time, so um, he right. just came. O he just came over like you know he was just being friendly and welcoming, and and that's what I think attracted mm -hmm. me. To the class because it was me i was there with two other people and we were just sitting there by the entrance watching and he just came over and was like hey you know what you want to come join us and you know it was like oh you have to sign these papers you have to do this you have to do that and the other but um yeah, but yeah it, he, he it was genuine it was genuine i recognized that right off the bat <laughs> See that that's that's what that's what that's what that that's why I I I posed the question that way because because I knew that's what you were gonna say. He still does that. Have you yeah. noticed that he still does that? It, it, even though it's it's a video from Hawaii and you're watching it wherever in the world you are, 
you still get the imp- you you still really this guy's the friendliest guy out there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, know? and, and you can't you can't teach that. It's like in acting when they say somebody's got that it factor. Bert's got that it factor. Mm-hmm. That's that's what it is. It's like a light. You're just attracted to you're just attracted to that. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And for, lot, for sure. Yeah, and a lot of the the, the great thing about it is um, he. I think he attracts like people because I could say all, well, 90% of the students I've met, you know, through his class and stuff, the same, same type of personality. And a lot of us still keep in mm-hmm. contact with each other to this day. Um, Larry Lee, uh, Peter Kim, um, Dan Cagle, uh, Laura Fergoso. I just uh, found out she lives in my city. Um, I met her at the USC College Club back in the day. So when all this social distancing stuff um, ends, right. we're going to get together and swing the stick. So if you're watching, hey, Laura. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, okay. So so you guys start training at USC. And um, you, said, you said that you and Chad went up um, to, was it, where do you say, for, for Bert? Who was in the tournament? Everybody or just Bert? That, that tournament you said um, you commuted up to? Uh, there was a lot of people in the tournament. Uh, Chad and I just went up there to watch because at the time we were um, fairly new students in the club, but we were progressing along. But um, Bert was going up. He went up there to co- actually compete. Um, and at the time they had a, a forms division and a, mm-hmm. uh, a stick fighting competition division. And um, um well, the other great thing about being able to travel up there was um, I got a chance to meet um, uh, Leo Gahe, um, okay. Angel Cabales before he passed, um, Sam Tendencia, a lot of the you know legendary Filipino martial artists. And so that was yeah. a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Yeah. That okay. picture you're showing now, it's funny. I was going to – I didn't know what I was going to mention that, but um, – that was the um, WECAF, World Eskrima Kali Arnis Federation Stick Fighting Tournament. Bert talked me into competing in because when I first joined the Kali Club, um, I just wanted to learn how to defend myself because I was the skinny kid growing up, kind of shy, you know, and uh, I had, it's, I was, wasn't bullied heavily, but there's those incidents we all experienced growing up in school. And so yeah. I, I didn't want to feel vulnerable. So I, I said, well, let me take self-defense so I can learn how to defend myself. And so as I got better and better, Bert approached me one day in the Long Beach class. He said, hey, why don't you join a stick fighting tournament so you can get some, you know, real experience on, you know, on how the stuff works. And I'm like, okay, sure. You know, I, I had no intention <laughs> of competing whatsoever. But, you know, that's Bert, right? Now, watch, try it. Okay. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so myself and another student, um, Desmond Hatchett, we were training in the school for the tournament. And so the day of the tournament comes, and they have weight classes. And uh, actually, when I was at the tournament, I was there uh, with my parents and uh, my ex-wife at the time. We were dating, and they were in the audience, and I'm sitting watching, you know, the lower weight divisions. And my mom got real concerned. So when she watches yeah. this, she'll, she's just going to start laughing. Yeah, because you know how mothers are. So she's yeah. watching these, these these kids hit each other with sticks and stuff, and we you know we've got the cage on our head and the body pads, and they're they're the lighter rattan sticks, you know, they're not the solid ones. And so my mom's watching these people beat each other, and she turns to me and she's like, "You're gonna let those people hit you? Oh, Richie, I don't I don't know, I don't know." And I was like, "Come on, you know." <laughs> so. My dad, you know, I, I had to get up and leave because I was, you know, getting that energy from. I was like, okay, I got to go focus. So I got up and I went and competed. And the other guy standing next to me, uh, Byron Gray, um, he, uh, I was, my understanding was he was the the champion in the in the weight category from the previous year. So I, uh-huh. I didn't know anybody. Yeah, uh, because we were the only two in the super heavyweight division. Um, I only had that one match with him. And so um, um, the way the rules are, you have to, um, you know, it's three one-minute rounds. And if you drop your stick, it's like a TKO and it's, you know, the round ends. Or if you disarm your opponent, it's like a TKO and the round ends. And the way it worked out, um, I disarmed Byron three times. And I think the longest round was like maybe 30-something seconds. 
Mm-hmm. And so, um, so there was that. So, uh, but it's funny be- because um, years later, I got married. I moved to Chino Hills, and I'm in the store one night, like ten o'clock at night, getting some something for one of my kids that was when they were a baby. And I'm walking down the aisle. I go and turn around the aisle, and who's standing in the aisle? Byron. And so we look at we look at each other, and we just started cracking up. We're like, "Hey, man, what's up? What's up?" And we, you know, we're saying, "Hey, how you doing? How you doing?" And turns out he lived in, in uh, Chino Hills at the time too. And um, so I asked him what he was up to, and at the and at that time he said he was just starting to get into uh, the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So um, yeah, but yeah, Byron was a uh, he was a very worthy opponent, but see that's the other wonderful, the other wonderful thing about the martial artist because you can be standing in front of somebody with a stick and trying to you know knock their head off one minute, but then the next right. minute you turn around and you're like brothers. So it, it's yeah. that brotherhood yeah. of that bond. Did did I wonder if that existed in basketball? Did that exist in basketball, or do you think it's unique to martial art? Uh, it, I experienced it in basketball as well. Um, cause when I was in junior high school, I remember playing against a kid that was, um, in one, in one of our rival schools and he and I were going at it. I mean, we, we were almost came to the point a couple of times of going to blows. That's how, you know, stressful this game was. And then that summer I ran into him again at a, at another tournament my brother was playing in and we just saw each other. First thing we did, we smiled, shook hands, started catching up. And we actually ended up playing on the same team together uh, that summer in a summer league. So, yeah, I think it's just. Uh, so I think it's, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No. So then, what? Because you know, we were talking earlier about the millennials and and what have you. And there's this thing now. I don't know if you've seen it online, but there's this thing about Bruce Lee. Oh well, Bruce Lee doesn't uh, count because he has no fight record. So it's like they have this idea, right, that competition, right, competition is it. But here you just gave a perspective on competition. So so two things. One, what do you think of that Bruce Lee has no fight record nonsense? But then also, what is the true role of competition then? Yeah. Well, the, to answer your first question, uh, that whole Bruce Lee never competed. And so, he, you know, he's not a real you know, martial arts type thing. Like I said, I've never met the man, but it's from everybody that that's lived contemporary with him and that knew him personally, that's a bunch of bull. Um, James, De, I think James DeMille um, has a um, video on, on, I've seen it on Facebook, but it might be on YouTube, but he, he tells people firsthand about his background and being Bruce Lee. Uh, I'm sure Guru Dan can tell stories, um, you know, Competition, um, Bert, Bert told us one time about this, that really with competition, it's designed for to drag a fight on. So like in boxing, you wear gloves, right? So nobody gets seriously hurt. Um, you wear protective mm-hmm. gear. Um, you know, they have rules where you can't do certain things, like you can't kick to the groin, you can't finger jab in the eye. You know, there's, there's certain things you can't do because they want the, the fight to drag on. So... I think competition is good for testing your skills and for seeing what works and what doesn't. Uh, like Bert said in his interview, from a scientific standpoint, uh, it's good to mm-hmm. test those attributes uh, in a way that's not um, too devastating to the body. But um, I think it, it, it has to be put in perspective because um, the competition is not a street fight. In a street fight, it's totally different. I've never been in a street fight. I've never actually never been in a fight fight. Um, so somebody might say, oh, well, you've never been in a street fight, so you don't know. Well, I can tell you that with the training I've done, um, the difference between competition and a street fight is attitude. You know, like in the stick fighting tournament, you know, we had the protective gear on, and it was just about hitting and scoring points and maybe disarming. That's it. But if I'm if I've got a stick in my hand, and I'm walking down the street with my kids and somebody jumps out in front of me, it's a whole different story. It's not gonna go three rounds. It's gonna be over like that. And, and so it's really just right. the attitude and knowing 
you know, is this something that's going to drag out for three minutes or is this something where I have to end it like that? And so I think I think the mentality among some of the younger people now is because they're so exposed to the competition, um, they think of a real fight in terms of that. And when I lived in Long Beach, I used to drive down PCH and I would see people fighting in parking lots and stuff like that. And I've seen fights growing up. And a lot of times, you know, the fights, um, they start off with two people squaring off. They may, you know, be chest to chest, they're posturing, and then they'll, you know, get in their fighting pose or whatever, and they'll size each other up. But then after that, they just go crazy. They just start swinging wildly, um, no thought, nothing like that. So the difference is with the martial arts, what we're doing is we're trying to train a conditioned response so that it's automatic. We're trying to get that in the muscle memory. And that's what I love about the Filip Filipino Kali because they don't teach techniques, they teach concepts like the X pattern. So if I, if, so if I practice the X pattern, that starts to get in my muscle memory. So if I have a stick, I'm not thinking, okay, do I do technique number five or technique number 12? No, I just, that X pattern, I just start swinging. And so that's, and it's not unique to the Filipino martial arts because I find that in Capoeira, it's, yeah. it's similar because in Capoeira, there's different, you know, kicks and different movements. But then when you're playing in the hora or in the circle, you know, you don't know what that person's going to throw at you. You just have to react. And they call it playing Capoeira because it's like a game. Mm -hmm. You know, you, somebody comes at you with a certain kick, you respond, but then you come back with another kick and then they respond. So it's a back and forth. Whereas, uh, and then um, mm -hmm. uh, I think to a degree, the Indonesian martial arts are like that as well. Um, boxing is like that because when you're boxing, what you have jab, cross, hook, uppercut, those four punches, you know, if I want to simplify it, but then when you get in a ring or if you watch a professional boxing match, there's an unlimited number of ways you can combine those four punches. And so that's where that element of surprise right. comes in. Yeah. Um, when when did you get involved in, in the capoeira? Because you look the same age in all your pictures. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, well, I got to thank my mom and dad for that. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> I, I, other than this, <laughs> because this is, um, I'm saying some people <laughs> might not be used to this, but this is my, I decided to stop shaving when uh, we started going in self-imposed isolation. So this is my self-imposed isolation look. Yeah. But, um, okay. yeah, but I okay. was in Capoeira, I believe it was, um, it was in the 90s. Um, and again, Bert's the common denominator because um, he told me about a, a Capoeira workshop at the Inosanto Academy. And at the time, um, Amen mm -hmm. Santos was doing a workshop. And he's the, he's the um, for those that don't know him, he was in the movie Only the Strong at the very beginning. Uh, and Amin, that guy, amazing. That guy, because he was about, he was about as tall as Bert, but, at, but I think at the time yeah. he, he was probably like maybe 20 pounds heavier than Bert and it was all muscle. I mean, the guy was just like, a, he was just solid. But then to watch him move around, and, and mm -hmm. I mean, he would jump up in the air and flip and land without making a noise. And to see somebody that big move like that, it's scary. <laughs> and so I went to the Capoeira workshop. And yeah. <laughs> it is. It, it's scary. So um, so I went to the Capoeira workshop at the Inosanto Academy. And then I talked to him in afterwards. And he was telling me that he had a um, class um, in LA, I believe it was off the 10 Freeway and Robertson at a dance school. So I went to a few of those classes and um, one of the people he had helping him was a, a um, capoeirista named um, Joselito Santos. No, it was um, Nilson Reyes, Nilson mm -hmm. Reyes. And um, Nilson, another incredible martial artist. He was probably like half my size, but not an ounce of body fat. And the dude, I mean, just incredible. So I worked out with them for a while at, the, at that school once a week. And then through that class, I met a, a guy named Jamie Brown. And Jamie and I were talking. And so Jamie started t um, teaching a, a Capoeira Angola class um, at Lamert Park. And so then I started going to his class at Lamert Park and continued with him for 
um, sometime. I don't think it was, I don't think it wasn't, it was maybe six months or so because at the time I was living in Orange County and so I had to drive from Orange County to LA. So that, and, and I had young kids, so that kind of took a toll. So I, I was with Jamie for a little while. Yeah. And then a few years later, um, I, uh, what, how did I, find, I found out, oh, that's what it was. Um, one of Bert's uh, students, Karina, she was telling me about a Capoeira class um, over by the Beverly Center. And that's why I met Jim Sarah. And so um, I started taking Jim Sarah's class. Um, oh God, I can't remember what year that was. But I was with Jim for about, I want to say at least three or four years. And um, his, his organization is called Asociação de Capoeira Corpo e Movimiento. And um, I became a monitor in his, in his system. So I was able to um, teach the classes in his absence. Ah, and the other thing that you're you're uh, certified in is uh, is Bach Frances with uh, Nick Sagnat. Yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, I, my my first um, Sabat instructor was. Um, I think I went to a, a workshop that Salem gave in uh, at the Insanto Academy, and um, then I and met a gentleman named Mike Di Giovanni, and um, he was um, he started me off in Sabat. And then uh, he introduced me to Nikolai, and then um, that's and then I started testing my first. I took the thing with Savat that I liked was um, like in some of the traditional Japanese arts, you start at the white belt and then you work your way through to the black belt. Uh, with Savat, instead of belt rankings, they have glove rankings, and so the highest I think there's six of them, and the highest glove ranking is silver. But with Savat, they have a, a like a, a sheet or a list of techniques that you have to know for each glove level. So you don't have to start at the first one. If you're mm -hmm. enough to start at silver, you can do silver. So I think I did my first test at the white glove level, which is I think the fourth one. And then I wow. took the yellow, yeah, then I took the yellow glove test and then I took the silver glove test. So. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah love, love the lot. Yep. Yeah, the only thing I don't have is my bronze gloves. Yeah, and I'm, and I, I still I, that's why I have to stay in shape because I still might get that. But I heard you have to go to France to get your bronze gloves. So um, I'm just uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so the the reason when you, when you mentioned uh, Amen Santos, right? The reason the reason why I started smiling is because my guest either next Wednesday or next Friday on the dialogues is Mark uh, Whittier. Mark and I met on the set of Only the Strong. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you've seen them okay. firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so, so here's how small a world it is. When we got the call to come audition for this movie, and then I, I got hired I called Sifu Dan and Bert, because Bert was still in the movie thing in 1993. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I go, okay, so we're gonna go work on this movie. What do we do? And Bert says, well, there's gonna be a lot of downtime. So take an equipment bag and just train while you're there, yeah. right? And again, like I've said to people before, it's not my fault that I happen to be Dan Inosano's Miami-based student. So Amen Santos, right? He knows my teacher. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> right? so I had an in, but you can't blame me for that. Right? Hey. Yeah, it is what it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it was. Uh, yeah, so that that's why that's why I start I started smiling when um, when when you said that, and uh, I wanted to ask you also about this picture, because in reading up on you, somebody made a comment about you don't want to get hit by Richard Spinkick. 
What? Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> what? I, I just, that was at a demonstration we did at Chinatown. And the guy on the receiving end of that kick is my Savat instructor, Mike DiGiovanni. Because uh, the way we did the um, uh, demonstrations back then, Bert would feature different things. Like he'd uh, feature the Junfan kickboxing. He'd feature the Filipino uh -huh. martial arts, the sticks, uh, dagger, you know, the disarm, some of the different flow drills. And so yeah. that was when we were featuring Savat. And so... Um, and I don't know who took that picture, but they caught it perfect because Mike and I were doing a drill where I'm in, you know, I'm in left foot lead and I throw like a lead fuerte or, a, you know, like a sidekick. And then Mike would scoop it and spin me around. And then I'd come around with my right leg and do like a, a reverse with my right foot coming right. from his, you know, mm -hmm. and so he'd block it. That particular mm -hmm. time he threw, he spun me around and instead of doing the reverse, I decided to do another kick he showed me where you chamber your foot and then you do a kick coming from the other side. Right. So, yeah. so you're expecting the kick to come from this side, but then the kick comes from this side. And they caught it. Uh -huh. That's why it looks like he's turning into my foot. But uh, right. yeah, that's, yeah. That's, all, that's all Mike DiGiovanni. That's, he's my Savat instructor. <laughs> yeah. The other reason why I was smiling throughout your, your recounting of the, your um, Savat experience is because I, got, I went from no rank in Box Francaise to White Glove mm. in 1988, my first, okay. my first test with, um, with, uh, with Salem, because I, um, I spent a ton of time on my own in Boredas trying to be Bruce Lee. So, <laughs> so I worked a lot on, on flexibility and what have you. As a matter of fact, when, when yeah. we finish, um, when we finish, I'm, uh, I'll send, I'm gonna send you two things. Uh, I'll send you a picture of, of my old days when I could kick. And I'll send you, like I said earlier, the link to um, the broadcast about George Leonard's mastery and, and, and what have you. Right. Okay. I'm not done with photographs. Okay. Now you have to <laughs> now you gotta explain. Well, you don't have to explain it, but you have to give us the story behind this because from what I've seen, this plays an important role in your life. Oh yeah. Well that uh, lady there, her name is DeAndrea Mitchell Wood, and that was that last year that was last year in i believe june or july uh, uh -huh. my latest and maybe this is part of the reason why i got this my latest um yeah. endeavor <laughs> is uh, chicago stepping <laughs> which is a dance that was um uh invented in the black community in chicago um it, it evolved uh -huh. from another dance called the bop but um i got involved in chicago stepping and my instructor now is a guy named Brian Patterson. So shout out, Brian. Um, he goes by Steppin B, or, and he's got a website, SteppinB.com. He teaches Chicago mm -hmm. Stepping in Ramsey Cucamonga. Um, another great person, great instructor like Bert. And um, he approached me one day uh, and said, hey, you know, we're having these, uh, well, actually, let me back up. There's a group in Chicago that uh, does this, uh, this contest every year called the World's Largest Stepping Competition. And uh, so yep. what they do is they hold prelims in different regions, and then the winners of those prelims in the different categories get invited to come to Chicago and compete in the finals. And so they have, mm -hmm. um, uh, see, a beginner's category, which is what I was in, um, um, old school, new school. They have a, a walking category, which is another type of dance, you know, dance they do and um, trio, sometimes where a guy will dance with two ladies. And so Dean, uh, Brian, so Brian asked me if, if I wanted to compete in the prelim. Well, he didn't ask me so much. He's like, you should be in the prelim. I was like, <laughs> uh, you know, just like with Burton, the stick fighting tournament, right? So I was like, uh, okay. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, see, my life has this, this pattern to it, as you'll see. But, I'm um, noticing that. I'm noticing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
So Brian asked me to be, and I was like, okay, but I didn't have a partner. And so I'm trying to think of who I can partner with. And there was um, some ladies in there that were good steppers, but, you know, because I'm tall, I was thinking, okay, well, there's the height thing. And, you know, I didn't know who to ask. And so D came up to me one day in class and said, hey, so do you have a partner for the world's largest? And I said, well, no. And she's like, well, can I be your partner? I said, sure. And uh, Dee's, um, she used to be in a, a dance with a group in San Diego, and then she started coming to Brian's class. And um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've watched her at different, at different sets and, and seen her dance, and she was a good dancer, so I was honored to have her ask me. But um, yeah. so we practiced and we practiced, and then we get to the prelims, and um, in the beginners category, there was only three couples, and all three couples were from Brian's school. So we get out there, and I wasn't planning on winning. You know, I just wanted to go out there, do good, look good, have a good time. And, you know, the butterflies are jumping. And uh, so we get out there, we compete. So after we compete, I'm sitting down eating. And then um, they're going on to something else. And then um, they started announcing winners. And then Dee says, hey, Richard, what are you doing? Come on, we won. I was like, we won? <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that picture was after she dragged me up there and... Uh, and uh, pulled me up there. So yeah. And so we went to, I think that was in June. And so the world's largest was in, I believe it was October of last year. Right. And so I yeah. flew to Chicago and I, I was relatively new on the job that I had. So I couldn't take any vacation time. So I literally flew out of Ontario at 11 PM on Friday night, arrived in Chicago mm -hmm. at 8 AM on Saturday morning took a taxi to Tinley Park, checked into my hotel, competed that night at the convention center in Tinley Park, went to a Sunday night, went to a, or Sunday, went to a barbecue at my instructor's family's house, and then D drove me to the airport Sunday evening to fly out. And yep. I was at work Monday. Yep. <laughs> yep. I, I, I remember that lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. I remember that lifestyle. Um, so it's it's interesting because I have never heard before five minutes ago. I've never heard of Chicago stepping, right? Oh, okay, yeah. And so here, once again, you are involved in something that's well known among the people to whom it's well known, but it's not necessarily well known um, to the to the world at large. Right. It is, it, it, that's just coincidence or is that that's not deliberate is it you just live that way uh, yeah it's it no it's it's definitely not deliberate um i've always liked to dance though because i grew up you know in the 80s you know pop locking running man you know i had the high top fade and the jerry curl <laughs> and, i saw yeah. a picture of the apple but i didn't, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought that was me. That was me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've always, yeah. I've always loved to dance, and so um, um, I guess it. We, as you get older, you know, um, like uh, the Pendekar said, you know, the older you, the older you get, the, the harder the ground gets, and so mm -hmm. yeah, I, I all that fast stuff, you, you start to, you know. As far from a dancing standpoint, I started to gear towards the smoother stuff and appreciate more of the, you know, the slower tempo music. And and the thing the yeah. thing I love about Chicago stepping, it, it, besides, well, the music is one thing. The other thing is uh, a lot of great people, and it, it just it, there's just a lot of life lessons in it because like the waltz and some of those other dances, it's a male lead dance, so the man has to lead. And um, today. I think you have a, you know, as it's a result of the women's lib movement and you know just various mm -hmm. social things, you have a lot of women that are very independent, very strong, but they're reluctant to let a man lead because they don't want to get hurt or they don't want, you know, they don't want to get taken advantage of again. But with Chicago mm -hmm. stepping, women have to have that comfort level where they can let a man lead, but then in letting a man lead, that puts the responsibility on the man to lead properly. Because there's a lot of right. men out there's a lot of men out there that think that oh well yeah they need to let the woman needs to I'm the man I'm the man the woman needs to let me lead but then the next question is well how are you leading where are you leading her mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. 
you know, anybody, you know, a person that leads, it's like, okay, you're lead, but where are you leading me to? You know, why should I follow right. you? So with Chicago right. Stepping, if you see the best dancers are the ones where the man is giving a, a strong lead and he's, and, and the mm -hmm. woman is following. And, and really with Chicago Stepping, the purpose of the dance is the man's job is to make that woman look good. So if I'm dancing with a beginner in the dance or if I'm dancing with somebody that's advanced in the dance, my job yeah. as a lead is to make that woman look good. <sighs> okay. Now, now you've exasperated me. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> yes. Because I just thought of a question to ask you. Okay. I'm going to put you in a difficult situation. Ooh. All right. You're responsible for choosing the activity to teach a young man responsibility. You have two choices, Chicago Stepping or Jeet Kune Do. Which Ooh. one do you choose? Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> oh wow. Oh, I think yeah. we're in technical difficulty. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I'm going to take the easy way out and say they're, they're, they 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 they're like two branches that go off in the different directions, but they have the same base. Like if a tree has two okay. branches, because with JK, yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> with with uh, with JKD, um, when I was at the USC College Club, um, our logo we had a a triangle with um, three letters in the corners, L, C, and H. And it stood mm -hmm. for love, compassion, and humanity. Because mm -hmm. the purpose of the arts, uh, in addition to teaching you how to defend yourself, was also to reinforce the, uh, the, you, the love, the compassion, and the humanity you were supposed to have for everyone. Because mm -hmm. you know, no matter how good of a martial artist you are, um, no matter you know, how tough you are, there's always somebody out there that's tougher. And even if there's not, you know, it's like that famous line from Enter the Dragon where at the beginning where Bruce Lee says, well, why doesn't somebody pull out a 45 and bang, settle it? You know, yeah. there's no technique that's tougher than a bullet. So in, in, in the final analysis, it's about being a good human being and it's about having that love, compassion, and humanity for all life because in learning how easy it is to take a life, uh, part of the dichotomy or the yin and yang of the martial arts is it teaches you to appreciate life that much more because it is so fragile. Uh, yeah. So, so there's that lesson in, in JKD. Um, uh, it also teaches um, self-confidence. Um, I remember at Burt School in Long Beach, there was a lady, and I can't remember her name, forgive me, but um, she had three sons. And her youngest son, I think, with time was two. And she used to bring him to class with them all with her all the time. And the two-year-old, you know, he's around all these adults all the time. So he's a typical two-year-old. He's shy and reserved. But I remember one day I was there and I was sitting on the bench, you know, talking to some, you know, people waiting for class to start. And she walked in with her sons and they came walking behind her like ducklings. And the two-year-old was, was walking behind her. And the thing I noticed about him, I, he was older than two at the time, but, um, you know, not much. But he was walking straight up, his shoulders were back, his head, his chin was up, and he walked by me and he's like, hey, Rich. Mm -hmm. And that impressed me because to me, that captures what the martial arts can do for a person's self-esteem and, right. and just, you know, and, and just, you know, make increase their confidence level. So that's what the martial arts has to offer. And, and hopefully by respecting yourself, you can respect your fellow man. Now, Chicago Stepping. Same thing, you're not learning how to hurt anybody, but you're learning how to um, properly handle a woman, properly talk to a woman, properly respect a woman. And mm -hmm. women are sitting there, you know, because it's a traditional dance, so normally at the sets, the women are sitting around and the men go around and ask the ladies to dance. Now, sometimes mm -hmm. the ladies, do it for, but for the most part, the men go and ask the women to dance. And so there's an etiquette. So when you have men that are following that etiquette, that are being polite to a woman, asking them for a dance, thanking them afterwards, walking them back to their seat. 
and everybody's dressed up like this. And then you have mm -hmm. ladies that are being treated like ladies. They're not being disrespected. They're not being called out of their name. You know, that creates an environment where um, a person can grow and thrive and flourish. And if somebody doesn't have that attitude, they can, hopefully it'll rub off on them. So I see those two as, as um, branches of the same kind of trunk. And, and maybe that's what yeah. why I'm attracted to both of them. Yeah. Well, see, this is why this is why I am attracted to doing what I do with this program, because because of what you just did. You just humanized the art of Jeet Kune Do. You see, you just you just took it way beyond like when we started talking, you just took it way beyond finger jab to the eye and <laughs> to the knee. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Which, which I, it, it, to me, we need more of that and less of the other. Because yeah. it's real easy to hurt people. Yeah. You, too, you know, but... Yeah, too easy. <laughs> but to learn to take responsibility which really comes out of self-confidence. Yeah. You, you know? So, so I get the sense that that, um, let's call it the, the, the issue of well-behaved young men in our community, you understand what I mean by our community, yeah. I get the sense that that is important to you. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I have, I have two sons. I have four kids, two sons and two daughters. But, you know, as a father of two sons, yeah, it's, that's very important to me. Yeah, I mean, and then you're from L.A., so the average L.A. role model is from straight out of Compton. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well to, be, to, to be fair, to those who know me, to be fair, uh, I was born in L.A. and I lived there for about three years, but um, I pretty much grew up in Orange County. So, okay. yeah, the people, so. Um, the, You're annoyed because Newsom, Newsom is punishing Orange County because everybody else can open their beach, but Orange County has to close. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's funny because I was talking to a friend of mine about that yes the other day, and I think it's it's a different dynamic in Orange County because that area, Huntington Beach, uh, mm -hmm. you have a um, predominantly white, predominantly um, middle class, maybe upper middle class, um, conservative community down there that's not used to being told what to do. They mm -hmm. move to the that, that there's a, it's a whole beach lifestyle and people move down there for that lifestyle. So um, because we're in, you know, difficult times, um, I think what you're seeing is a reaction to a group of people that have a certain sense of self entitlement that aren't used to being told what to do. And that's, that's the reaction you're seeing now. Um, if you go to certain yeah. um, areas of LA, um, you, you'll see streets that are barricaded. Um, you'll see, you know, a, a larger police presence, and the people there, they're um, conditioned to behave differently around authority. So um, I think that's what you're seeing there with with the, the beach situation in in, Hunting, in um, Huntington Beach. Yeah.
Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not sure what happened, but I looked up and I noticed we'd been on for over an hour. So I started, I said, okay, time to oh. uh, get out of this hair. And, and then the, the, the internet dropped out. So um, oh. what I wanted to ask you was, so now, now it's messing with me, but what I wanted to ask you was what role does, does JKD play um, now in, in, your every, in your everyday life? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think now, um, JK, JKD is, it's, it's, um, I look at it as, as a lifestyle. Um, I don't look, I, I mean, it's, it's on one level, it's a martial art, but I look at it also as a kind of like a, a Okay, I guess we're back. The technology gods saying, Dwight, you've you've wasted enough of this guy's time on a Friday evening in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. um, I, while you while you were gone, I noticed that um, Rayanne Shepherd says, "Sing a song, Richie." Knock him. That? Knock him off him. Knock him off him. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What's, 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 what's that about? <laughs> that's the next podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here we um, are. Uh, that's that's funny. Um. All right. So okay. So 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 uh, say that again, and I'll. I'll I'll clean this up in uh, in it in because you you mentioned Larry was it Larry Lee your workout partner is is that did I get that right Yes yeah Larry Lee yeah um, yeah and then um, yeah I mentioned Kalindi earlier another martial artist I want to mention who's no longer with us is John Tessier um, excellent um, he started out I believe in judo and jujitsu but he was one of Bert's students and um, he recently passed away too but another excellent martial artist yeah um, okay so so while I was finagling there I didn't hear the the answer to your your, your um, to the question of, of present day Kendo um, activity. Can you go through that for me? Yeah. Um, well, um, one of the things that Bruce Lee um, talked about was absorbing what's useful, rejecting what's useless, and then adding what's specifically your own. And I think that's just a great overall life lesson in general, because everybody faces adversity. And um, to, to that extent, we're all the same, regardless of what color, what nationality we are, whether we're born rich or poor. But uh, the degree of success that we experience has to do with how we handle that adversity. And so 
Um, a lot of the JKD principles that apply to fighting also apply to real life. And what I try to do is um, keep those principles in the back of my mind so that I can apply those to the everyday, you know, life lessons or everyday things that life will throw at you. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So just in case this, the internet decides to mess with me again, um, I like to ask people at the end of the program, if there's anybody that they have in mind that I should try to get onto the show. Oh, um, let's see. Um, I saw Lester. He, he talked to Lester. He talked to Bert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bert, Bert's um, been on four times already. <laughs> oh, wow. So, <laughs> she changed yeah. to the books and chronicles. <laughs> um, the, the, the one person that stands out, well, um, if you get a hold of uh, Jim Sarah, um, he would be a good person. He's a, he's a, um, one of the professors at Cal State LA. He would be a very good person to interview. Um, okay. uh, uh, let's see who else. Um, Amin Santos, if he's available. But um, Larry, Larry Lee, I think he would be a good person to do. He's uh, one of my workout partners, but he's... Um, a senior to me in the martial arts, and he's got a lot of good experience in other martial arts in addition to JKD. Mm -hmm. uh, um, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, I mean, even though we know each other, I, I, you know, sometimes I hesitate when it's not it's somebody that I know really, really well, but I, I really enjoyed this. And um, will, will you promise to come back? You don't have to sing a song, but will you promise to come back a second time? <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And again, thank you for all that you do. And thank you for this podcast. Um, this is going to be a great record for JKD for uh, those practitioners in the future. And uh, I have to say, you're probably one of the best interviewers of, of all the people in the media. So I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank, no, I, I, I appreciate that. All right. Okay. All right. So everybody, that was episode 124 with Richard Rycraw. Uh, thanks again, Richard. And uh, uh, I'll talk to you again soon. I will send you, I'll send you those two things that I promised. Okay. Okay. All right. All okay. Right. All right, everybody. That's it for uh, the G Kondo Dialogues. I'll see you guys around next time. Take care. All right. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Uh,